Hello and welcome to the Neuroanatomy Lab Series here at UCLA. These videos are designed to help you get sort of the same instruction that you would either during the summer or in the fall if you were physically here on campus. So we're going to go over a lot of different brain models, thalamus models, spinal cord models, as well as a couple of dissections. If at any point in time you get confused or you start to feel overwhelmed, please reach out to us. You can contact us either via email, Google Docs, uh, on the CCLE discussion forum, or attending office hours. We're here to help you, and we just basically want you to reach out the moment you feel that you're getting overwhelmed, because this course pretty much takes off relatively quickly. One last thing that I want to mention before we get started is that everything that I say up here is found in your lab manual. For the lab quizzes and for the lab practicum, we're gonna use the images that are found in the lab manual and the lab slides themselves, as opposed to the specimens that we're showing in these videos. So those are going to be your bread and butter for studying for the lab quizzes and the lab practicum. Again, if you have any questions about any of that, please don't hesitate to reach out. So today, we're going to do a sheep brain dissection. But before we get started, I wanted to just talk about how we orient ourselves when we're talking about structures relative to one another, or if we were to talk about the front versus the back of the brain. So this is what's found on the first couple of slides. So I'm gonna use this human brain model here. And hold it like so. So the common terms that you'll hear a lot are lateral, medial, dorsal, or sometimes uh, superior, and then ventral or inferior. So dorsal or superior just kind of means on top. So if you were to talk about structures that are closer to this surface of the brain, that would be dorsal to structures you found, find essentially lower here. The ventral or inferior would refer to structures that are closer to this side of the brain than, than the top. Some other terms that you may hear are anterior or rostral. Rostral would be like rostrum or nose. That would be this side. And then the opposite is posterior or caudal, caudal meaning tail, so this side. Now, I did mention lateral or medial. So to show you kind of how those terms are used, I'm gonna take this apart a little bit. So lateral just means off to the side, whereas medial means towards the midline. So if I were to talk about two structures, such as the corpus callosum, which are these fi fibers that you see right here, or you know axons that are going to and from either hemisphere of the cortex, or the insular cortex, which is this guy right here, we could talk about how they are oriented relative to one another by using those terms lateral or medial. So if I were to say the corpus callosum in relation to the insular cortex, I would say the corpus callosum is medial to the insular cortex. Or conversely, I could say that the insular cortex is lateral, away from the midline to the corpus callosum. One other thing I wanna quickly mention about dorsal and ventral, Sometimes you'll kind of see in animals, the dorsal ventral axis is a little bit different than in humans. And that's essentially because with humans, we are bipedal. So if I put this back. So the spinal cord in humans are essentially gonna come out this way, where in like, you know, a dog or a deer or a horse, the head is kind of tilted up and the spine goes this way. So dorsal ventral kind of lines up in those animals, but in humans, it kind of curves. Anterior or posterior remains consistent. So this is always anterior, this is always posterior, whether you're referring to a horse or whether you're referring to a human. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind if you hear dorsal and ventral and it, it seems a little inconsistent. For a lot of the different cuts that you will see, either on MRI or actual physical cuts, you'll see coronal, sagittal, and horizontal cuts. Those are the main ones. So coronal essentially is a cut that goes through both ears or like a plane that's kind of parallel to that. So if I were to cut the brain like this, that would be a coronal cut. Sagittal divide is essentially a cut that divides the brain into left and right halves. So if I were to cut the brain like this, so I'll peel this guy, this would be a sagittal cut. This would actually be a mid-sagittal because it goes directly through the midline. Sometimes you'll hear mid-sagittal or you'll hear parasagittal. Parasagittal just means off the midline, so just kind of on the outside of it. The other one, the third one, is a horizontal cut. So if I were to cut the brain into top and bottom halves like this, this would be a horizontal cut. Sometimes you'll hear axial or transverse cut. Um, this is less common. Uh, you'll see it sometimes in MRIs. If you go to like medical school, you'll, you'll see it. If you go to graduate school, you'll probably see it a little bit. But for our purposes, we probably won't show you a whole lot of these because it gets really confusing when you're seeing a lot of coronal cuts and sagittal cuts to also throw in a horizontal cut, which is less common. Okay, with that, we're actually going to transition now to the sheep brain dissection itself. 
OK, so now we have our sheep brain. And we are going to go ahead with the dissection. But before we make any sorts of cuts, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the structures that you can see on your sheet brain, um, and as well as some stuff you can see on the ventral and the dorsal surface. So one thing that you'll notice is that the difference between the sheet brain that I have here and your lab manual is that the lab manual sheet brain still has the dura matter, which is the outermost, toughest layer of the meninges. Meninges being those protective outer coverings of the brain and spinal cord. So you can readily tell that there's no dura mater here because you can see, see the difference essentially between, between this one and what's in your lab manual. Uh, another indicator is on the ventral surface. Right here is where the pituitary would be. Um, essentially the pituitary is encased in the dura so when they take it off they usually, sometimes they cut around it to leave it. Um, but they kind of rip it through uh, when they pull it out, and so you, you essentially lose the pituitary gland. You also lose part of the optic chiasm, which I'll kind of point out. It's kind of ripped here. Uh, that's because the nerve, the optic nerve, actually comes through uh, essentially the dura mater, and so when they pull that, they, they pull it off too. So most of the, the sheet brains that we actually have in, in, these, in these labs essentially don't have that there. So that's just something to keep in mind. So just on the meninges, there are three layers. The dura mater, which is the outermost layer, the uh, arachnoid layer, or sometimes called the arachnoid mater, and the pia, pia mater, which is the innermost layer. Um, these brains actually have the arachnoid mater and the pia mater still attached. The pia mater hugs the brain really closely. Uh, the arachnoid mater, I can actually tell, is still present because you can see blood vessels. The blood vessels are actually between the arachnoid and pia mater. So you can see all these. So these guys here, I can actually see if I can peel some of that arachnoid off and get some of this. Uh, it might be hard on this side. Let me pull some from the ventral side. Yeah, so right here you see all this web, spider web-like stuff. That is arachnoid modern. What I've actually pulled here is some blood vessel. Um, so you can actually clean it up if you wanted. See all this spider web kind of stuff? It kind of almost looks like dead skin too. Um, that's essentially arachnoid matter. And that's where it gets its name, because essentially it looks like, you know, spider webs. Um, some other things that we can see before I go into the ventral structures are you can see the gyri and sulci. So gy gyri, or gyrus, if you're talking about singular, are these bumps, these hills in the, in the brain. The sulci, or sulcus, if you're talking singular, are the grooves in the brain. Um, so we can see those as well. So let me just skip ahead here. Okay, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the, the ventral structures. So I'm going to flip this guy over to the ventral side. So I'm going to hold it here. I'm going to kind of orient it this way for the close-up camera. All right, so some of the structures that we can see, this is kind of hard because in this brain it's been kind of mashed, but these are the olfactory bulbs. So the olfactory nerve, or cranial nerve one, uh, actually comes out of the olfactory bulbs and uh, goes into the nasal cavity. And you can see the olfactory tract that kind of comes down here into what's gonna be the piriform cortex. This is referred to as the uncus, the, the amygdala are, are in there. I don't know if that's necessarily identified in the lab manual that you have here. Um, but something interesting to note. Then we have the optic nerve, which kind of comes together to form the chiasm. Again, on these sheep brains, it's kind of damaged here when they removed the dura matter. And then the optic tract, which you can kind of still see here, sends that information to the lateral geniculate nucleus, one of the nuclei of the thalamus that we will learn about in our thalamus lab. The infundibular stalk is essentially the the tissue that connects the pituitary gland with the hypothalamus, which again, you can't see. Most of these brains, you'll see a little hole. So the little hole that's between the mammillary bodies and the optic chiasm, that's essentially what we're referring to when we talk about the infundibulum, because that's where the stock would be that connects the pituitary to the hypothalamus. Then we can see the mammillary bodies. They're kind of hard to see here. You can kind of just see this, this bump here. Uh, that's one of the nuclei of the hypothalamus. And then actually, what's really interesting here is you can see these guys. And I'm kind of pulling. This is your oculomotor nerve. Some, usually I see on brains that they actually get removed. This is one of the cranial nerves, cranial nerve three, that's involved in eye movements and controlling eye movements. We'll actually talk about that a little bit when we talk about the cranial nerve lab. Uh, 
um, and all the cranial nerves and their functions. Then we have the midbrain, which is the essentially the topmost portion or the superior most portion of the brainstem. So you can kind of see here, and you can tell that these are ocular motor because they're actually coming out of the midbrain where the ocular motor nuclei are. Again, that's something that you don't need to know at this point, but you will learn about uh, in subsequent labs and in lecture. Okay, and from the midbrain, if we go a little more caudal, you can see, or I guess uh, this would be a little more inferior, you can see the pons. So these are the bumps right here. And then just below the pons, we can see the medulla, which then goes into the spinal cord. And on the other side of the pons, you can see the cerebellum, because the pons are essentially relaying information to the T cerebellum. Uh, let's see, what else can we see? Let's flip to the dorsal side. So we can see the longitudinal fissure. It's kind of stuck together a little bit here because of the arachnoid mater, but this is just the large groove that separates the two hemispheres. Uh, the cerebellum, which we can see down here, and the spinal cord, which is connecting the, essentially, uh, the brainstem. All right, so what I'm gonna do for the, dorsal, the rest of the dorsal structures, we can see them kind of by pulling the cerebellum down. So I'm gonna kind of do that now. But there's all this tissue here. So I'm just gonna gently remove some of this arachnoid and kind of peel back. I actually want you to see the pineal gland. So I'm gonna wedge in here a little bit, gently separating them so we can see some of these structures. Okay, so I'm gonna peel this back here. Oop. Actually, I'm going to use the scalpel a little bit here just to gently get rid of some of this arachnoid. Okay, so I'm peeling back the cerebellum. So this is the fourth ventricle that kind of goes underneath the cerebellum. And here you can see the tectum. So you can see the superior colliculi. So those, that's going to be a stop for visual information and it's involved in like, you know, eye gaze and stuff like that and a little bit of visual processing. And just below that or inferior to it, you can see the inferior colliculi. This is one of the main stops in the auditory pathway of ascending auditory information. Collectively, they're referred to as the tectum or sometimes they're called the corpora quadrigemina. Same, they're essentially terms that are used to collectively refer to all of them. So if you see the terms tectum or corporal quadrigemina, they're just referring to the colliculi, superior and inferior. And then in here, you'll notice that there's a little bump. That's the pineal gland. The pineal gland is going to be involved in modulating your circadian rhythm. It produces melatonin. Um, which is the same stuff that some people take when they go on flights to try and help make them sleepy. Uh, Rene Descartes actually thought this was the seat of the soul because it was the only structure in the brain that was not bilaterally represented or it w didn't have a structure on either side. So you'll notice that the colliculi have a left and a right side, um, whereas the pineal gland is just one. So he, he initially thought that it was the seat of the soul and actually he thought some memory processing went on there, but that turned out not to be the case. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm now going to make a mid-sagittal cut. So I'm gonna cut it directly down the midline and essentially separate it into two, two halves so that I can see some of the structures along the midline. So I'm gonna invite the cameraman to come over here so I can essentially show you the cut. So you can do this at home. Surprisingly, you can actually get these brains and uh, do some of these dissections at home in case any of you are following along. So I'll try and give you instruction as I go along. So I'm gonna kinda of just wiggle these apart a little bit. If you tear a little bit of the cerebrum, or the cerebral cortex, it's okay. Because um, we're essentially gonna cut down this line. Um, but I just kinda wanna separate a little bit so I can get my scalpel in there. So these scalpels are that we use in the lab are actually um, not very sharp, and that's for safety reasons. So if you're using something that's really sharp, just be careful about your hand placement. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna just kinda wedge it in here a little bit and I'm gonna press it forward, and then I'm going to try and go straight back. Once I get to about the occipital lobe, this back lobe here, I'm then gonna peek in a little bit and make sure I'm on the midline. You wanna cut right between the two bumps of the superior colliculi. You wanna prevent yourself from doing a sawing motion and cut straight through the cerebellum and through the spinal cord. <laughs> 
There we go. Beautiful. All right. So you should see something like this. And we are going to go through some of these structures really quick. So uh, this one. So here, this is kind of a little bit awkward. I'm going to kind of wiggle this through a little bit. So here you can see this structure right here. It's kind of hard to differentiate between the cingulate gyrus that's above it. But this is the corpus callosum. So these are these white matter tracks that are connecting the two hemispheres. And just below that, you can essentially see this cavity. That's the lateral ventricle that um, essentially houses cerebrospinal fluid. Some of this stuff in here is, let me see if I can get it. This is choroid plexus, which is essentially involved in producing cerebrospinal fluid. So it's, um, it essentially filters the blood, the blood plasma to produce cerebrospinal fluid in that cavity. Uh, some other structures, we have the pineal gland, which we saw when we kind of peaked uh, this way. So if you had this brain, you could kind of look. We cut right through it, so you can see it on this specimen here. Um, then we have the superior and inferior colliculi. Again, we're seeing this from the midline now. The optic chiasm is going to be kind of hard to see on this specimen. So again, if we flip it up to the ventral side, you can see where it was. So it would essentially be right here. But it got destroyed on this specimen when they essentially yanked it out. Um, the mammillary bodies are right here. So again, that's going to be really important for learning and memory. And they'll actually send through the mammalothalamic tract some projections up to the thalamus, the anterior portion of the thalamus, also known as the anterior nucleus. So this right here is the thalamus. So of the ventricular system, which you'll learn about in another lab, the third ventricle is actually between the two thalami. So when we did this cut, we essentially cut through the third ventricle, separating uh, the two thalami from one another. Other stuff that we can see from this cut that we talked about are the pons, which is this little bump here, the cerebellum, which is up here. This has this nice tree-like shape uh, from the white matter and the cortex. Um, this is called the essentially the arbor vitae, or tree of life. You can see the cerebral aqueduct here, which can essentially is the, the ventricle structure that's going from the third ventricle, the cerebrospinal fluid that's flowing down through the cerebral aqueduct down to the fourth ventricle, which is this little cavity found just underneath the cerebellum. We can also see the midbrain, which is up here, um, and then the medulla, which is just, just post the, uh, the pons. And then, of course, down here, this is where it starts to become a uh, spinal cord. So again, I just want to talk about the ventricles again just really quick. So we have the lateral ventricle. These essentially drain cerebrospinal fluid into the third ventricle through the intraventricular foramen. And then that's going to go to the cerebral aqueduct and then down into the fourth ventricle. So there's also a diagram that's on your uh, lab slides that shows pretty much the same thing in a human brain which you should be kind of familiar with for the uh, essentially the lab quiz and the lab practicum, the structures on the sheep brain as well as on the human brain. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to try and make some coronal cuts. So I'm going to get a fresh one really quick. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're just going to do a couple of coronal cuts. Usually when we have everyone here in the laboratory, if you've already made your mid-sagittal cut, you can just take one of the hemispheres, and this is kind of described in the lab manual. You can just take one of the hemispheres and do these cuts and then kind of fold the tissue back, and you should be able to see a mirror image on either side. I'm going to try and do some of these coronal cuts here with a full sheet brain so that we can kind of see both halves um, actually laid out here on the slab. So the lab manual kind of shows about the regions where you want to cut. Um, so there's like red dashed lines that kind of show it. So you'll want to try and do one around the corpus callosum, one around the chiasm, uh, usually one around the mammillary bodies, maybe a little bit posterior to it, and then definitely one through essentially the colliculi. So I'm going to take this one here. So the first cut I want to do is pretty rostral. So I'm actually going to do one about through here, through. All right, so this is looking pretty good. I'm going to cut this one here so 
I can lay it flat. Right, let's see, we're going to want to do one just a little bit posterior to that. Nice. Let me clean this up a little bit. So what I'm looking for when I'm doing these cuts is I'm actually looking for the structures on the ventral surface that I kind of want to cut through. So for this next cut, I kind of want to cut through the chiasm. So I'm going to try and cut at least through where it was and do our best. That's a nice one. All right, through the next one, we're going to want to go back a little bit, maybe through the mammillary bodies, because we're going to want to get through the thalamus. You also, one thing you want to be careful of that I'm not necessarily doing here is you want to try and go straight down. It's going to be really tempting to kind of cut it aside. So you kind of see here, I actually didn't cut quite straight down. You see how it's a little curved? And I started kind of like straight down here, but then I kind of moved the the scalpel over a little bit you, you want to try to avoid doing that um, this last one i might actually cut through through the top so this is also easier when you're doing a sagittal cut because you can see all those structures um, actually before i do that i want to get through one more that's a little bit about here So these aren't too bad. And then there's one last one that I want to go through the colliculi. So I'm going to kind of look at the top, the dorsal surface, and try and cut straight through them. So I missed it just a little bit, but that's OK. Okay, so I have laid, the way I've laid these out are essentially from uh, anterior most or rostral most to eventually posterior most or caudal most. So I'm going to point out some of the structures. This is closest to plate 9 in your atlas. So you can see some of the structures that we've identified. So there's the corpus callosum. So again, you can kind of, even though this isn't stained, you can see the white matter that goes across either side, right? So this is, these are the fibers that are connecting the two cerebral cortices and across the two hemispheres. So it's connecting right about here because it crosses the midline. So this is the anterior most portion of the corpus callosum. And you can't really see it too well on this one, but essentially we're going to start forming some of the caudate in the putamen, which you can see on you know plate nine of your, your uh, lab manual. We can see them a little bit better if we go a little further back. So this is a little bit more caudal. Again, we can see the corpus callosum, and we start to see a little bit of the septal nuclei, um, but that's not important for our purposes. What we really want to see is this guy right here. This gray matter right here, this is the caudate, one of those basal ganglia structures. And then the putamen would be kind of on this side. We're starting to see some of the in internal capsule that separates them to uh, the two of them. So here we can see the corpus callosum going across again between the, the two hemispheres, but we can also see the lateral ventricles here. And then immediately hugging the lateral ventricle is the caudate. So we can see that on both sides. Then if you were to go a little bit lateral to the caudate, you will see essentially the internal capsule. These are white matter fibers that are connecting the, the cortex to fibers that are going uh, through the brainstem or to the brainstem. And then you can see the putamen and the globus pallidus is kind of in here. Globus pallidus means pale globe, so it's kind of hard to see on an unstained specimen, which is where it gets its name. It just kind of looks like it's part of the, the internal capsule. All right, so now if we go even further back, the basal ganglia structures really get pushed to the edges, and it's really hard to see. This giant structure here, this is the thalamus. And you can still see the corpus callosum connecting the two hemispheres over here. But you can also see the fornix, which we haven't really talked about yet, which is essentially uh, the major output of the hippocampus. 
but we can see the essentially the thalamus um, readily apparent. And then, of course, you can see some of the corona radiata that we can kind of see coming out from where the internal capsule was. If we go a little bit further back, a little more caudal, we can start to see the fornix forming into the hippocampus. So the hippocampus has like a seahorse shape and it kind of wraps around. You'll see this more, most prominently in uh, subsequent labs, but you can see part of it kind of come and it wraps around and then you can see a ventral part of it here. So this is the hippocampus, which we can see really prominently. See, so you can kind of see how it, how it wraps around and then comes up to form the fornix. So it would wrap around and kind of come out this way. If we go a little bit more caudal, now we're starting to hit the midbrain. So we can see the superior colliculi, which are these bumps here. This is part of the occipital lobe that we've cut off as we also did our cut. Um, and then this guy right here, this is the cerebral aqueduct. So that's connecting essentially the third ventricle to what will be the fourth ventricle if we were to go further back and get to the cerebellum. Okay, so that concludes the sheet brain dissection. Um, all of the structures that I pointed out on these coronal sections and on the ventral and dorsal surface of the sheet brain and the mid-sagittal cut are found in your lab manual. Any you know, quiz materials or lab practicum materials are going to use the actual images that are in the practicum um, or maybe a really nice fresh image of one of these specimens here. So use the lab manual to study. That's, that's the best uh, thing that you can do for preparing for the lab quiz or the practicum. And at this point, we're going to transition back after I clean this up to the human brain model so we can see some of the same structures that I pointed out here. So that's the sheep brain dissection. Now we're going to transition to just showing some of the same stuff that you saw on the sheep brain on a human brain model. So I know that you don't have access to this right now, but interestingly enough, Amazon has a pretty, pretty detailed model that's pretty similar to this one. This one costs about you know two thousand dollars. This one is available on Amazon for about twenty, thirty bucks. Don't quote me on that in case it's more, but. It's, it's pretty extensive. So if you wanted to go over the same structures at home, uh, this is an opportunity for you. This one's called 4D Human Brain Anatomy Model. You can ask any of us about it if, if you were interested and you couldn't find it, and we'll, we'll direct it to you. Uh, but we used to give these to the neuroanatomy students that were, that were here, and um, they loved it. I actually have one of these at home, and it's, it's pretty nice to refer to, and you can take it apart just like this model. But in case you don't have one of those, we're going to essentially show you some of those structures here. So I'm actually gonna face, there's another camera over here, and I'm actually gonna face a little bit this way, so hopefully you can see all of them as I point them out. So I'm gonna grab this guy here. Okay. So the first thing that you can see are the olfactory bulbs. So notice how the olfactory bulbs are, are a lot smaller here than you would see in the sheep brain or like a rodent brain, for example. It's kind of interesting that for a lot of mammals, pretty much everything is in the same anatomical region that you see in other mammals. So in the human brain, you'll notice that the olfactory bulbs are positioned in the same area that they are in the rodent cortex. But the rodent really uses their sense of smell a lot. And so the olfactory bulbs are massive compared to the cerebrum. In humans, not so much. One of the cranial nerves, uh, cranial nerve one actually comes out of the olfactory bulbs, which we'll talk about in the cranial nerve lecture. Here you can see the longitudinal fissure, which is just that giant groove that separates the human brain into the two hemispheres. And then we can see the optic chiasm. Uh, chiasm gets its name from chi, the Greek uh, letter that is just an X, which is where it gets its name because it's essentially where uh, optic fibers cross over to the other hemisphere. Just posterior to that, you can see the mammillary bodies. It's kind of hard to see on this model. There's these little green bumps in here. Mammillary bodies are really important for learning and memory. Some of the fibers that are coming from the fornix come down to the mammillary bodies, and then from there they go to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, another thing that we'll talk about in subsequent lectures. Here we have the pons, which is relaying information through the middle cerebellar peduncle to the cerebellum. And then down here we have the medulla, which is eventually going to turn from the brainstem into the spinal cord. So I'm going to flip this guy over here. Something else that we can see, they make it really prominent on this model, but it's the central sulcus, which is this large sulcus here that divides the frontal and parietal lobes. 
So you'll hear the motor cortex often referred to as the precentral gyrus. So this is this, this bump here. Um, that's essentially your motor cortex. And then past the central sulcus, or post-central gyrus, is the somatosensory cortex. So that's part of the parietal lobe that's involved in sensory processing. Inside here, if we were to just pull this apart, you would find the insular cortex. So often you can't see it because it's, it's hidden in, in between the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. But if we remove this, you, you can see it. The insular cortex has a lot of functions. You'll see some of them listed in your lab manual. Um, just inside the insular cortex, there's actually a region called the claustrum. You don't need to know this for, for the, um, you know, the lab quiz or the practicum, but the claustrum has been implicated in you know, feelings of awareness or consciousness. People who have damage to it essentially feel like they're in an altered state of consciousness, which is really interesting to me. The insular cortex itself is also indicated in addiction. There was a study not too long ago where individuals who had damage to the insular cortex through like, you know, an occlusion of the middle cerebral artery or so forth. Um, if they were smokers, they actually didn't have cravings anymore for smoking, which is really interesting that uh, a structure like this could be implicated in addiction. I'm not saying that people who have addictions should just like damage their, their insular cortex, but it's, it's interesting how some of these different brain structures can alter things like, you know, addictive behaviors. Okay, um, the major lobes, which we go over in lecture, you know, frontal lobe, you know, parietal lobe, occipital lobe way here in the back, it's largely involved in vision, and then the temporal lobe. There's another lobe called the limbic lobe, which is kind of hard to see, see on this model. It usually hugs around the corpus callosum. Um, some other structures, we're gonna talk about these a lot in subsequent uh, labs and lecture, but just to highlight some of them, these again are in your lab manual, so you can refer back to it. We can see the insular cortex, which I named just a minute ago, the lateral ventricle. So here they're kind of shown as a, a model. Interestingly enough, da Vinci actually, probably hear about this in lecture, but da Vinci actually had some of the first drawings of the lateral ventricles because he took cadavers and put, put wax to fill in this cavity. This is here as a, a model, but it, it's actually a space that's filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Just lateral to that, there's kind of these red guys here. That's the, the caudate nucleus. I'll show you that in better detail in a second. I can pull this off. This is the corpus callosum. Again, those white matter tracks that connect the two uh, cortices. And then here we can start to see it a little bit better. So I'm going to remove part of the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe. You can see this, this green guy here. This is the, the fornix and part of the hippocampus that's coming over on the other side, which we'll see in a later lab. So I'm going to take this apart here. So here you can kind of see that. This is where this was kind of sitting in. So here this is the fornix. It's not labeled in this lab manual that the hippocampus is, and you can kind of see that here. Again, focus on the labeled term, like the red terms or the stuff that's circled in a, you know, a red circle or a red box. Um, and then the last thing I want to show you is on this model. So I'm going to take away the insular cortex if I can get it off so you can see. So if we were to remove the insular cortex just on, just medial to that on the inside, we can see the basal ganglia structures. This is going to be covered extensively in one of your later labs, but you can see the caudate here, the putamen, some of these striations where you can start to see some of the white matter coming through. You can see it really prominent on this side. That's essentially going to be the internal capsule. On the dorsal surface of the brainstem here, we can see the pineal gland and then the tectum, the superior and inferior colliculi. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that you can see on, on something like this brain model. You don't need to know all of it today. Just focus on what's, you know, bolded or, you know, circled in your lab manual. But by the end of the lab series, you will be able to identify all of these structures, name them, and even talk about a lot of their functionality. So with that, that concludes the first lab. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out, and I'll see you in lab two.